We'll be looking at, obviously, first theme would be something to do with Passover. Uh, of course, most people, most of you people anyway, realize Jesus did not die on Good Friday, neither did he raise from the dead on Easter Sunday. He uh, rose from the dead on uh, Yom Rishon of Hagmatzot, the Feast of First Fruits, and uh, he died on Ed of Hag. Easter comes from the Quadrisimian Schism after the church began to paganize the first Sunday after the spring solstice, uh, spring equinox. Uh, but that's not according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, or 1 Corinthians when it happened. Nonetheless, we don't squabble about the day. We know it did happen. It's, of course, Passover week, Hagmatzot, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Turn with me, please, to Exodus chapter 13, the 13th chapter of the book of Exodus. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you prayerfully and thankfully, Lord God, thanking you for your blessings, especially the blessing of salvation, the forgiveness of sin, and the promise of eternal life because of the Lamb who was slain. Let us never take the blood of your Son for granted, Lord God. Let us never grieve your spirit. Let us understand, Lord God, what you've done for us and what you gave us when you gave your Son in our place. We should always remember these things, Lord, but at this Passover time, at this Easter time, this Passion Week time, Lord God, we especially think of these things. Be with us this day, Lord God. Let your name be glorified, your people edified, your son's body built up, and the fellowship here in Ainsdale, blessed, enriched, edified. In Jesus' name, for Jesus' sake, amen. Exodus chapter 13, please. Verse 10, therefore you shall keep this ordinance at its appointed time from year to year. Now it shall come about when the Lord brings you to the land of Canaan as he swore to you and to your fathers and gave it to you that you shall devote to the Lord the first offspring of every womb, the first offspring of every beast that you own, the males belong to the Lord. But every offspring of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. But if you do not redeem it, then you shall break its neck, and every firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. Quite a week. Two weeks ago, in preparation for the Easter season, a conference was held in Bethlehem in the Holy Land. And there, the wife of the American preacher, Bill Hybels, joined Brother Andrew, a man I once respected, I held him in high esteem at one time, I really did, and of course Stephen Sizer from England. And they got together and they did their usual denunciation of Israel and sung their usual praises of quote-unquote the Palestinian authority and all that stuff. Well, the same day they were doing it, the same day they were doing it, the Palestinian authority closed down the Christian TV station in Bethlehem. (laughs) And they didn't utter a word. The Israelis, the Jews, let the Christians have their TV station, but the Muslims closed it down. Not only that, but the TV station was not (laughs) pro-Israel. What the Arabs say in Arabic, first the Saturday people, then the Sunday people. They don't care. They'll turn their back on the persecuted church. They'll turn their back on Christians having their rights being taken away. As long as you hate Israel, you're all right. I recall about a year ago when Mr. Sizer went to Iran at the invitation of the Iranian government-funded Institute of Holocaust Denial. He was invited by the Iranian government to appear on Iranian government television to denounce Israel. Iran has martyred according to Barnabas Fund, 98% of its Christian pastors. It has martyred, murdered, 98% of its pastors. That was perfectly okay with John Stott's partner, Stephen Sizer, the Anglican. As long as you're against Israel, you're my brother, you're my friend. (laughs) Just think, the one country in the Middle East that protects the human rights, religious freedom of Arab Christians, of course, Iran and Persian Christians, well, that's Israel. That's the one we've got to get. The very day they were denouncing Israel. 
Well, God says, this land that he swore to your fathers. Uh, does God swear and not mean what he says? <laughs> well, if you're an Anglican, he does. Uh, it's quite a thing. It's the same old nonsense. But we'll let God deal with them. Let's understand verse 13. Every first offspring of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. If you do not redeem it, then you shall break its neck, and every firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. This is something in Judaism called the Pideon Haben, the Pideon Haben, the consecration, also called the redemption of the firstborn, the Pideon Haben. Look with me, please, to Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16. Circumcise then your heart and stiffen your neck no more. Circumcise your heart and stiffen your neck no more. And Deuteronomy chapter 9, uh, verse 26. I'm sorry, verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 6. Know then, it's not because of your righteousness that the Lord your God is giving you this land to possess, for you are a stubborn people, literally in Hebrew, a people with stiff necks. A stiff necks. So in Exodus chapter 13, verse 13, we have three creatures, beings as it were. We have the firstborn human man. We have the donkey and we have the lamb. A donkey will either be redeemed or it will have its neck broken. A donkey is obviously a figure of some kind of a person because the lamb is a figure of a person. Well, we know, of course, who the lamb is a figure of. It's a picture of the Lord Jesus, the Lamb of God, as the Catholics in Liverpool say, Agnes Dei qui tolus peccata mundi, down at Paddy's wigwam. <laughs> the lamb is a picture of the Lord Jesus. Who is the donkey a picture of? Jews are a microcosm of the human condition. Look with me, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We point this passage out many times. Verse 6, these things in the Exodus happened as examples for us that we should not crave evil things as they also craved, or be idolaters as some of them were, etc. And in the same passage, we read, verse 11, these things happened to them as an example that were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. God uses Israel and the Jews as a mirror for us, they are microcosms of the human condition. What were they like? Like the rest of the human race. Although God loved them, although God wanted to bless them, although God chose them, although God wanted to use them, they were a people who were perpetually stiff-necked. Look with me, please, to Proverbs chapter 29. Verse 1, a man who hardens his neck or stiffens his neck after much reproof will suddenly be broken beyond remedy. People stiffen their neck. Donkeys are a picture of fallen man. Donkeys are a picture of human nature. They are naturally very stubborn animals. Unlike their phylogenetic cousin, the horse, they're not brave. A horse is brave. But they're not brave like a horse. Neither are they all that clever. Like their half-brother, the, it's called the petted in Hebrew, a mule, is more clever than a donkey, usually. A donkey is not that clever. A donkey is not that brave. A donkey is quite stubborn. 
It's fearful and it's stubborn. However, it does have quite a potential. It is sure-footed. It can go places a horse's can't, if you can get it to go there. <laughs> it's quite strong. And its stubbornness, in some cases, can be a virtue. Nonetheless, it's stubborn. It stiffens its neck. A man who hardens his neck, stiffens his neck after much reproof, will suddenly be broken beyond remedy. There's only one hope for a donkey to be redeemed by the lamb. There's only one hope for an unsaved person to be redeemed by the lamb. People who resist the gospel, who resist Jesus, who resist God, who persist in whatever it is they persist in, they become stubborn, they become fearful. Remember in Revelation, those who fear go to the lake of fire. Those who are fearful, those who are stubborn, those who persist in it, they just won't listen. They've heard the gospel a hundred times. They've heard the gospel a thousand times. Maybe they've intellectually even understood it. Their neck will be broken suddenly beyond remedy. There's a point of no return for those people. God is gracious and forbearing, but they only have one hope, to be redeemed by the Lamb. Those who do not get redeemed by the Lamb will have their neck broken. Now again, this is the Pideon Haben, the redemption of the firstborn. God gave the tribe of Levi for the other tribes. Okay, So you wouldn't have to give your firstborn. Of course, this is a picture of Christ, the firstborn of the Father, the redemption. And the price of redemption of the firstborn, the Pideon Haben, is a half shekel of silver because Jesus was betrayed for silver. Silver is always associated with redemption, the price of redemption in Scripture. It's a picture of Christ, obviously. He's the Lamb. To this day, Orthodox Jews will celebrate the Pideon Haben. They'll bring the firstborn son and they'll carry the baby in, literally, on a silver platter and present it to God in the dedication. And then they won't cut its hair until it's three years old. And they'll bring him in, unless, like a Nazarite, they won't cut his hair until he's three, and they'll bring him in on a silver platter. This is the Pideon Haben, the Pideon Haben, still practiced by Orthodox Jews. Well, let's understand more about the stiff neck that must be redeemed. Look with me, please, to the book of Exodus also, chapter 34. Verse 20. You shall redeem with the lamb the first offspring from a donkey. And if you do not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. You shall redeem all the firstborn of your sons. None of you shall appear before me empty-handed. Once again, why does it put the redemption of a firstborn son together with the firstborn of a donkey? Because that's what people are. They have the same character as a donkey. They're stubborn. They resist God. They're fearful. There's only one way to go. You're either going to be redeemed by the lamb or you're going to have your neck broken. It's as simple as that. There's no hope for a donkey. There's no point in telling a donkey not to be a donkey. That's what a donkey is. You're not going to change a donkey. A donkey is stubborn. Look with me, please, to Second Chronicles chapter 30. Verse 8. Now do not stiffen your neck like your fathers, but yield to the Lord and enter his sanctuary, which he has consecrated forever, and serve the Lord your God, that his burning anger may turn away from you. God is angry. He warns people, don't stiffen your neck. Don't be like a donkey. Don't do that. Yield to the Lord. He's angry. God is angry at sin. The only hope is the lamb. He poured out his wrath on the lamb, 
in order to save the donkey. That's what it is. Whether we like to think of it or not, that's what we are. We are donkeys. A lamb is not like a donkey. Jesus was not like us. He had no sin. He was not stubborn. He came to do the will of his father. He didn't resist it. Why should the lamb die for the donkey? Why should Jesus die for me? Why should Jesus die for you? But that's what he did. Look with me, please, to Exodus chapter 32, verse 9. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, they are an obstinate people, but in Hebrew it says stiff-necked. The Hebrew word for a donkey is hamor, hamor. And it is quite a rude term to call somebody a hamor. In, 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 in the Hebrew language, in, in modern colloquial Hebrew, it's rude. You're telling somebody that they're not just stubborn, but stupidly stubborn. <coughs> it's a rude term. And if a non-Jew was to call a Jew a hamor, it's considered anti-Semitic because it's the stiff-necked Jew. What they said, you know, they wouldn't accept Christ, so we're going to kill you in the, in the, the Middle Ages with the pogroms. Don't ever say it to a Jewish person. If you're not a Jew, it'll be taken the wrong way. Even though it's true, not simply of the Jews, it's true of the human condition. They're pictures of fallen man. Remember, which one of the sons of the patriarchs was going to be a wild Donkey of a man? <laughs> Just look at them. Look what Muslims are like. Look what Islam has done to the Arab world. Now, I've had a few Muslims pray with me to receive the Lord. By the grace of the Lord, I have led a few Muslims to Christ, but only a few. Only a few. Only a few. I know some Arab Muslims who've gotten saved, but only a few, not many. I've been able to lead Jews to Christ by the grace of the Lord, a number of them, and a number of Catholics and various other people, but only a couple of Muslims. <laughs> Wild donkeys, stiff necked. They just. Allahu Akbar! You just. Inundated, they're incensed with this. You may as well talk to a donkey. Such it is. Look with me, please, to Jeremiah 19.15. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I'm about to bring on this city and all its towns the entire calamity that I've declared against it, because they've stiffened their necks so as not to heed my word. This, of course, is prophesying the destruction of Jerusalem in 585 B.C. by the Babylonians, which was, of course, repeated and recapitulated in 70 A.D. Why? They would not heed his word. Why would they not heed his word? Because they were donkeys. In other words, you either accept Jesus Christ or you're a jackass. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. People who will not be redeemed by the Lamb will have their neck quickly broken. We have unfulfilled prophecies in the Old Testament that have never happened historically, including the utter obliteration, not just destruction, the obliteration of Damascus. These places are going to be wiped out. Why? Just like Esau. These terrible things that have happened to the Jews throughout the centuries, why? They'll have a broken remedy. Only one hope for a jackass. That is to be redeemed by the Lamb. No other hope.
no other hope. Having understood this, let's interpret this in light of the New Testament revelation of Jesus. Turn with me, please, to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 16. We'll begin in verse 15. Forsaking the right way, they've gone astray. Notice it's talking about backsliders here. Having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he received a rebuke for his own transgression, for a dumb donkey, speaking with the voice of a man, restrained the madness of the prophet. That's quite a thing. That's quite a story. There was a film series in Hollywood in the 1930s and 40s called Francis the Talking Mule, and there was a TV program from America in the 60s called Mr. Ed the Talking Horse, but it was all modeled on this. It obviously goes back to this. This is one of the strangest stories in the Bible where the donkey talks to him, but he behaves as if it's normal to have a conversation with a jackass. Well, when you talk to an unsaved person, you're talking to a jackass. <laughs> There's no hope for them. There's no point in telling a jackass not to be a jackass. It's their nature. No hope for them whatsoever. They're not going to stop being it. They can't stop being what they are. It's their nature. The only thing they can do is be redeemed by the Lamb. That's it. That's it. But what happens once the donkey is redeemed by the Lamb? What happens when a donkey is redeemed? You know, by way of genotype, not phenotype, but genotype, donkeys have a natural cross on their back. That's interesting, isn't it? That's interesting. Let's read this story. Numbers chapter 22, verse 29. Well, we'll begin in verse 22. Numbers 22, 22. But God was angry because he was going, and the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as an adversary against him. Now he was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand, the donkey turned off from the way and went into the field, but Balaam struck the donkey to turn her back into the way. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path of the vineyards with a wall on this side and a wall on that side. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pressed herself to the wall and pressed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck her again. And the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn to the right or the left. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down on the Balaam, so Balaam was angry and struck the donkey with his stick. He kept beating it. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? Then Balaam said to the donkey, Because you have made a mockery of me, If there had been a sword in my hand, I would have killed you by now. And the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey on which you have ridden all your life to this day? Have I never been accustomed to do so to you? And he said, No. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand. And he bowed all the way to the ground, and the angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I've come out as an adversary because your way was contrary to me. Literally, in Hebrew, reckless to me. Or like recklessly hostile to me. 
but the donkey saw me and turned aside from me these three times. If she had not turned aside from me, I would surely have killed you just now and let her live. And Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I did not know that you were standing in the way against me. Now then, if it is displeasing to you, I will turn back. But the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but you shall speak only the word which I shall tell you. So Balaam went along with the leaders of Balak. And when Balak heard that Balaam was coming, he went out to meet him at the city, the city of Moab, which is on the Arnon border at the extreme end of the border. Then Balak said to Balaam, Did I not urgently send you to call you? Why do you come to me? Am I really unable to honor you? So Balaam said to Balak, Behold, I have come to you. Am I able to speak anything at all? The word that God puts in my mouth, this I shall speak. Well, let's understand what this is really about. We always interpret the Old Testament, the Tanakh, the Torah, in light of the New Testament revelation of Jesus. In this story, obviously, Balak was using Balaam to put a curse on Israel, on God's people. The donkey prevented it. And we're told by Peter it was a mad prophet. Remember, the words of a faithful donkey, a redeemed donkey, are better than the words of a mad prophet. The words of a redeemed donkey are more important than the words of a mad prophet. If there's one thing we have today, it's a lot of mad prophets. <laughs> well, let's look at this very briefly before we come back to it. Turn to Revelation, please, chapter 2. Jesus tells the church in Pergamum, where idolatry first began coming into the church, Verse 14, I have this against you, because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. Well, thus you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Remember, Nicolaitans, Nicolaity, suppression of the people, a clergy overclass, that were bringing people into a form of idolatry and cannibalism that was ritual eating. Obviously, this was the beginning of the Eucharist, of transubstantiation, this, this kind of thinking. Now, this Passover, every Jewish family would say, it's a memorial. What Jesus said at the Passover Seder was, Zegufi shenei ashba badchem, zot zikroni, do this in remembrance of me. No Jew would ever believe that the Passover was anything more than a memorial, albeit a very important one. It was not the same sacrifice. Well, so it was, but you had a clergy class now trying to seduce God's people. And uh, this was something that Jesus compared to Balak, picture of the devil, obviously, using Balaam, this clergy class, to bring his people into this idolatry. Today it's called the Mass. It's what it is. Well, let's go back and understand this story then. What is it saying in Numbers 22? He's coming to curse God's people. He's coming to put a stumbling block before them. Well, that's what he's trying to do, put a stumbling block before God's people. Same term that Jesus uses in Revelation chapter 2, a stumbling block. A stumbling block before God's people. <coughs> but the donkey saw the angel of the Lord. Remember, it is the angel of the Lord. Ha Malak Adonai, the definite article. This is a Christophany. In Judaism, known as the Metatron, it is a picture of, not just a picture of, it is a manifestation of Jesus, an Old Testament manifestation or appearance of Christ. This is the angel of the Lord, the same one who wrestled with Jacob, among other things. A donkey who's been redeemed will have its eyes open and see the Lord. They will see the Lord. They will see his sword. They will see what's going to happen. 
and the donkey will prevent God's judgment from coming. Notice the donkey prevented both Balaam from putting the stumbling block before God's people, Israel, but he also was able to prevent the angel of the Lord from destroying Balaam. Believers will stop God's people from being cursed, but they will also stop God's judgment from coming against the ones who would actually do the harm, the sin, the cursing. That's what happens when a donkey is redeemed. I believe it is, call it providential if you want, but certainly in the divine design that they have this cross on their back. It's hard to believe it isn't. So now we see something happens to a donkey. The same stubborn creature, the Hamor, the same stubborn creature. Now, its stubbornness, its stiff-neckedness, becomes a virtue. Go up the vineyard. He stops, he won't go. Whack! Go up next to the wall. Won't go. Whack! Go this way. Whack, you stupid donkey. Whack, you stubborn. That same stubbornness was preventing the judgment of God. That same stubbornness was preventing a curse from coming against the people of God. That same stubbornness was preventing a stumbling block being put before Israel. The Lord does not just save us to go to heaven. He saves us to fulfill a purpose in this life of this world. He takes our human condition. He takes what we are by nature and redeems it for his purpose. That same stubbornness. Oh, stubborn. Either that's going to cause the donkey's neck to be broken or the donkey will be redeemed by the lamb. And that same stubbornness. No. Resist Satan and he'll flee from you. Resist the temptations of the flesh and of the world. Resist the pressure to compromise. Stand up under persecution. Even when he was being beaten, he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't go against the Lord. He wouldn't hurt God's people, even though he was being beaten. That same stubborn characteristic that worked to his destruction now worked to his redemption. That's what happens to a donkey who's been redeemed by the Lamb. Same characteristic. Now he's resisting the right thing. Now his neck is stiffened for the right reason. Her neck is stiffened for the right reason. But let's look at this. The donkey wouldn't turn to the right, to the left. I'm not budging. I'm not moving. I'm not doing it. Being beating the donkey, the donkey would not give in. Just read the Fox's Book of Martyrs. Those people were stubborn. It didn't matter how much you persecuted them. They were stubborn. They just wouldn't budge. What was it? If you read the Fox's Book of Martyrs, the main thing that the believers in England were murdered for by the Roman Catholic Church under Queen Mary and so forth, the main thing they were murdered for not worshiping the Eucharist as Christ incarnate. Food sacrificed to idols, the stumbling block before the people of God. That was the main thing. Ridley, Latimer, Hooper, Cranmer, that was the main thing they were burned for. They'd hold up the, the, the Eucharist. Is this Christ? Will you worship this? It's a memorial. Burn him. And they would burn him. You're stubborn like a donkey. Didn't matter how much you beat them, they weren't going to budge. That donkey had a cross on his back. In other words, it was born for a purpose. But it had to be redeemed. It had to be born again. Otherwise, the purpose could not be realized. You I, we were born for a purpose. The problem is we are donkeys. The problem is we are stupid. The problem is we are stubborn. 
The problem is we are fearful. That's the problem. And there's no solution for the problem. Only redemption. Only redemption. Redemption by the Lamb. When somebody is redeemed, notice God's being speaking through the donkey. Is God blessing you today from what you're hearing? Well, if God could speak through Balaam's donkey, he can speak through Jacob Prash. What's the difference? One jackass is good as another. That's the way it is. That's what we are. Now remember, it said, don't stiffen your neck. Circumcise the foreskin of your heart. Circumcision is a picture of salvation, isn't it, in Romans and in Jeremiah? So what did David do when he killed the Philistines? He bought their foreskin. What did Samson kill them with? The jawbone of a hamor. Of a hamor. Mandibular triangle, inferior alveolar bone. That's what makes us talk. It's not the upper palate, it's the lower one. With the jawbone of ass, <laughs> something happens when God gets a hold of that jawbone and of that donkey. Circumcisions take place. People begin to get saved. That's what happens when a donkey gets redeemed. The Lord puts his words in the donkey's mouth. That's right. A redeemed donkey will always trump a mad prophet. But then what else happens? The donkey is able to stop Israel from being cursed. Right now. God's judgment is looming over America because of Obama, what he's doing. You know, the, the lies that you hear in the... Everybody knows, I always say it, an Apache cannot occupy Arizona. They were there first. A Maori cannot occupy New Zealand. An Irishman cannot occupy Dublin, but somehow a Jew can occupy Jerusalem. You know, an indigenous people, by definition, cannot occupy their indigenous land unless they're a Jew. Just, that's what they say in number 10. That's what they say in the White House. That's what they say in the United Nothing... United Nations, this is going to bring God's judgment. But you see, God has people who are simply redeemed donkeys, who will speak up, who will write those letters, who will appeal to Caesar, who will pray, who will say, this is hypocrisy. It wasn't the Israelis who blew up the London tube, or who rioted in Bradford. It wasn't the Israelis who did that. They're only fighting the same thing we're fighting, and it's going to get worse here. It was the donkeys who stopped the stumbling block coming before Israel. It was the donkey who stopped God's judgment from coming on Balaam. It's only these redeemed donkeys that can stop God's judgment from coming on the United Kingdom and on the United States. Only the donkey that's been redeemed not the rest of them. God will put his words in the donkey's mouth. But there's more to it than that. Even the rabbis admit in the Talmud that Zechariah 9.9 is about the Messiah. Let's look at it. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, Roni Roni Bat Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem, Bat Yerushalayim. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. Well, let's... Understand what this is. Once again, 
we always interpret the Old Testament in light of the New Testament revelation of Yeshua, of Jesus. Turn with me, please, to Matthew chapter 21, the Gospel of St. Matthew, the 21st chapter. Verse 1, when they had approached Jerusalem and come to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, Hadaziah team, Yeshua sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. Notice he's not looking for one donkey, but two, Jew and Gentile. And if anyone says something to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. Now this took place that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the fowl of a beast of burden. And of course they sang the Hallel Rabbah from Psalm 118 to Jesus in verse 9, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, la ben David. Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Barach nuhem mi bet Adonai. From the Machzor for Pesach, that's what they sang to Jesus. Riding on his donkeys. Notice this is the cult. You see, when the donkey is redeemed, the donkey becomes the bearer of Christ. When the donkey is redeemed, the donkey causes others to see Christ. Balaam couldn't see Christ. The donkey did. (laughs) But the donkey has a way of causing others to see Christ. Then what happened to Balaam? God tells Balaam, now you go tell Balak. You lead somebody to Christ? Next thing you know, they're witnessing and telling somebody else about Christ. It's amazing what God can do with a donkey. It's amazing how God can transform a stubborn jackass. Now an animal that is stubborn, fearful, can carry the burden. Now someone who was stubborn and fearful can carry the burden. Again, a donkey is more sure-footed than a horse. They can go through these navel crevices and things like this and cliffs just like a gazelle. I see them in the Grand Canyon in America, Arizona, going down. You can ride down into the Grand Canyon on a donkey if you don't weigh too much. I tried it, but the donkey wound up (laughs) riding on me. <laughs> the donkey took me down. I had to carry the donkey back up. <laughs> A donkey can carry the burden and go all kinds of places that others can't go. And it doesn't tire easily. Even when it tires, it keeps going. Very sure footed. What used to be fear is now just sure-footed. It can go into a dangerous situation knowing what it's doing. That's what happens when a donkey gets redeemed. Something that can only say, hee-haw, can now speak the word of God. God can slay the Philistine with the jawbone of the donkey. That donkey was willing to be beaten, willing to be persecuted, a fearful, a naturally fearful animal, willing to stand and be persecuted for the sake of Christ. That's what happens when a donkey gets redeemed by the lamb. But then a donkey becomes a bearer of Christ to whom others call out Hosanna. What does Hosanna mean? Save us. Save us. That's the way it is. 
If you're listening to this tape, I'm not trying to offend you, but the fact of the matter is there's the donkey and there's the lamb. And you're a donkey. Either your neck is going to be broken beyond remedy. If you continue to harden your heart, stiffen your neck against the word of God, If you continue to resist Jesus, the Lamb who died for you, remember, he's also a God of anger and justice who's standing there with a sword in his hand ready to slay you. What does he say to Balaam? Why are you persecuting the donkey? Why are you hitting the donkey? What's the first thing that Jesus said to Paul? Why do you persecute me? Why do you persecute me? No, there's not much hope for you. In fact, there's no hope for you. In fact, there's no hope for anybody. Unless you're redeemed by the firstborn. There's no hope unless you're redeemed by the Lamb. You're going to say stubborn. You'll remain stubborn. You're going to stay stupid. You're going to stay fearful. Your neck will be swiftly broken beyond remedy. Or you will be redeemed. Now if you're redeemed, the cross on your back will mean something. Jesus said, pick up your cross and follow me. If you're redeemed, God will get a hold of your jaw and put his words in your mouth. If you're redeemed, you'll even be willing to be persecuted for the sake of Christ. If you're redeemed, you will be able to prevent God's judgment from coming on this nation, on society, on others. If you're redeemed, God will use you to prevent others from cursing his people Israel and from cursing the church. If you're redeemed, you will become a bearer of Christ. A Christ to whom others call out, Hosanna, save us. That's the only choice. You can't help what you are. I can't help what I am. That is the human condition. That is the nature of fallen man. Fearful, dumb, and stubborn. Nothing is going to change that. Nothing will ever change that. It doesn't matter if you go to Mass on Palm Sunday. It doesn't matter what you do, what you say, what church you go to. No church is going to change it. Nobody is going to change it. You're just going to be a donkey because that's all you can be. Nobody can make a donkey anything else other than what it is. Nothing can change it except God. Only God can change the nature of a donkey. That fear will become a sure-footedness. You'll know where you're going, you'll know why, and you'll know what you can do. He'll get a hold of your jaw. He'll put his words in your mouth. He'll speak his word. He will use you to prevent his judgment from coming against others. He will use you to cause others to open their eyes to see him. He will use you in a way you would not believe he will take your very stubbornness and turn it into a virtue. He will take you and make you one who is a bearer of his salvation. He will make you one who carries Christ. He will make you one to whom others will look the Christ you carry and say, Hosanna, do save us.